So screen is visible uh, to uh, everyone, right? If it's not, then let me know. Okay. Now, uh, any doubt, uh, any problem so far, lecture or in tutorial or in lab? If yes, please do ask. Anyone? No. Okay. So, if I ask you to debug your code, so let's say you have written So let's say uh, you've written uh, code, which is having maybe 200 line or 300 line. It is having nesting for loop, nested if else inside that for loop or outside a for loop. So how you will uh, debug it? What could be your approach to debug it? Debug it in the sense that uh, your code might be giving uh, uh, your logic uh, might be not correct for all the test cases. So in lab, you might have seen that uh, your uh, there are hidden test cases, which are corner cases, and some people are not able to so to get those test cases initially. So how to debug your code, whether uh, your logic that you have written or the the thought processing that you have done you have written your code so how to debug it to find any any flaw in your in your in your in your program anyone what could be the simple yet uh, effective way to do it sir i would try to generate cases where my logic is wrong so that would be exhaustive, right? Exhaustive in the sense you have to cover all the test cases and check whether your logic is correct for all those test cases or not, right? Yes. So consider there is a scenario uh, in software like the, so this is the this is the uh, good approach, but. Uh, initially, we don't try to generate all the test cases and then test uh, your code on, on those test cases. Let's say in your lab, you uh, don't, uh, let's say you missed some hidden test case. Okay. So, or your, you have written something, uh, you have, uh, you have initialized some if case with the assignment instead of comparison operator, which was double equals, but you have written single equal. So how to capture all those errors? With, their, with, with given all the test cases, you can capture it, but let's say you want to debug, let's say there are uh, pointers and some pointer is giving uh, you the segmentation fault or something like that. So how you will debug it? So whatever your uh, variable or your uh, function that is written, how you will debug whether it is correct or not whether it is uh, giving you the output as you are thinking. So what is this dry run, Ritik? So why you guys are even like that much uh, uh, like advance? Think something simple, whatever I've told you so far. It's very simple thing. So what do you have to see uh, on your terminal, whether you have uh, variable or the value of variable, how do you see it? Whether whatever value, whatever value by variable I've assigned a value, to that variable, how do you see it uh, in your terminal or on the output? Yeah. So 
the simple and uh, it works like every time. So just add lot of print jobs. Okay. Let's say here there are let's say something like this. So there is a while inside that while there might be for loop. There could be if. Okay. Now. There could be if, and in those uh, this while loop, there might be some computation. Okay, inside for loop also there might be some complex computation and variable declaration or initialization, and then there is a condition. And then there is a condition. Now you want to check your logic flow from here to here, from line, line number 31 to this line number 36. So how you will see, let's say you have a lot of variable, so you will do printf of all those variables. And those variable might be affected in these, uh, uh, these, these, these loops. So you will that printf of that variable everywhere so you will add here you will add the same printer here you will add the same printer over here as well okay. inside for two, outside for two, something like this and then there is a this if condition you can add the same printer over here as well okay so these are few uh, things so with this, you can track uh, the variable value, how it is changing when it is going inside this while loop, inside this for loop, inside its loop. So if it is not changing according to your, uh, your thought, then you have to change your logic. But if it's changing according to your logic, then your program is correct. There's uh, this, uh, in Dev C++, there is a debugger using which you can track after every line in your program, starting from the main. After every line, what is the value of all the variables that you've declared so far? So they track everything line by line. So when you go one line to second line, third line, fourth line, so every line, after executing every line, they will track the value of variable and show you. So inside Turbo C++, there is a this debugger. In GCC, there is a this GDB, which is a, which is also a debugger in Linux. So using which you can track the same thing, but using printf you can do it. You don't need to have this debugger and all this thing. So that is a very effective and simple way to uh, track a variable or logic, whether it is correct or not. So do we have to learn separate type of statements for that also for the debugging? A separate type of statement? Like in Python as far as I remember, there used to be certain type of statements which you had to write on the console to do it. No, 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 no. In 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 GDB, there are breakpoints. They are called breakpoints. So in GDB, you have to initialize some breakpoints using command line. You don't have to do anything in your code, actual code. You have to initialize uh, inside the, when you launch this GDP, and you assign some breakpoint, and accordingly it will wait when that breakpoint occurs. Okay. Clear? So could you give us an example with the program? GDB. No, no, this entire opening of debugging. Okay. Program. That would be So let's say you've written if uh, equals to equals to three. Or not. 
greater than or equals to zero, then you print Else you perform some computation and then you print F, let's say. Uh, you print it like this, okay. Now I'm checking the value of Y here. Okay. And let's say from above there are some computation which by default uh, which makes sure that the value of y is always greater than or equal to zero now when you try to let's say depending on this value of y you do some computation over here as well So why people are joining this much late? Uh, sir. Yeah. Uh, sorry, sir. Like I had, I came late because like uh, there was a problem. Like uh, there was some delivery, and I didn't know about it. So like I couldn't plan about that. Sorry, sir. Okay. Okay. So let's say uh, from line number thirty-two. So there are some computation, and it makes sure that the value of y is always greater than or equal to zero. Now, if this is guaranteed, then the part that you've written else part is kind of uh, dead code. This is called dead code because here you will not be able to reach here. Line number 37, 38. So how you will know whether you will be able to reach here or not by just printing the value of Y every time. Okay. When you print the value of Y every time in all test cases, you will see, okay, the value of y is always greater than or equals to zero. So that means there are two possibilities. Either my logic was not good of writing this else part, or I've done something uh, which is always making sure that y is always greater than or equals to zero. So I've done something bad. I might be a uh, silly thing could be y equals to minus y or if y is less than zero less than zero you have made uh, y y is uh, a minus y so it will make sure that y is always uh, greater than zero so you have done something like this but to know where is the problem in your code with printf you can pinpoint that thing Instead of printing the final uh, output, you can see whether uh, uh, where you have uh, the problem. Uh, okay, let me give a concrete example here. Instead of simple yet concrete. So let's say you've written a while loop, okay, with some condition. And now you take two input. Uh, some x and y okay now you compute the sum and you have written sum is equals to x plus y you have to compute sum of all the number all the x y that you have encountered so far so you have written something like this okay now you can see that this will not give sum of all the x y with this condition it will give sum of last x and y that you have got from the user not not some of all the all the uh, all x y that user has entered so far. Okay, so how you will uh, how you will debug this? You will add printf here of the sum. Okay, now you enter few values and you will find out. Okay, sum is just giving x plus y every time, and it is getting overwritten. 
So you don't have to overwrite it. You have to add the whatever the previous value of sum with this x and y. So this is like simple example. And depending upon the value of sum you are you have done, you are doing some computation over here. Okay. So that is why. So in the in the in the final printf, you are doing some printf, some actual printf, but here inside your logic above this, you are not calculating the sum the way you want to calculate because of this this problem. So either you look your code and you find out okay this is the problem, or you add some printf. So when you have just one file, 100, 200 line, you can look your code and see, okay, this is the problem. But when you have multiple files, multiple .c .h files, and multiple functions inside that, you have to use printf in those just, uh, those, those scenarios. Like in general, we use a lot of printf to see how things are going. Okay. So this is how you can exactly pinpoint the error. Is it clear? Yes. This example. Yes, sir. Yeah. Okay. So, any 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 doubt in this uh, associativity precedence? No. If no, then I'm going to delete it. So we have covered this uh, right shift and uh, left shift operator, right? So, can someone tell me uh, what is the uh, the behavior of this left shift and right shift. Which one is right shift and which one is uh, left shift? The one you wrote before, so I think that, that is a right shift one, and the right one is the left shift one. So this one is right shift, right? Yes. And this is left shift. So what does this right shift do? So it was to do with some power of two. I'm slightly forgetting. It was to do with some power of two. Yeah. So when you write uh, right shift of four with two so what it will do it will write shift four with two to the power two whatever you write here okay if you write one here so it will write shift four with two to the power one if you write four here it will write shift four with two to the power four which is 16. so if you write two here it will shift four with two to the power uh, two, which is four. So what will be the result of uh, this operation? Four is right shifted with two. What will be the result here? So if you know what right shift do, then you can compute the result. It will be 16, right, sir? No, it will be one. So when you right shift, it is division. When you do left, left shift, this is a multiplication. So here 4 will be divided by 2 to the power 2, which is 4 by 4, and the result would be 1. Here 4 will be multiplied by 2 to the power 2, which is 4, so it will be 16. Or if you write 3, so 4 will be multiplied by 2 to the power 3, which is 8, so it will be 32. So an easier way to remember is, might have seen this number system right number system video in which uh, they have talked about uh, this binary representation so when you represent this four to binary you get this one zero zero so when you say that you can use variable in, in this order. and yes 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 you can yes instead of constant you can say i left shift j or i right shift j it is simple uh, a binary operator like plus minus so when you say when you write four uh, right shift two so the value so how to remember it whether which one is division and which one is multiplication so you write like this so consider it as a binary and you write shift by two so when you write shift by two, so what happens? The last two digit is kind of, uh, kind of, uh, so it will be shifted by two places in the binary. So 
So when you shift it by two place, it will become one. So in in, in decimal, we uh, I've said that if you write four and write shift by two, so in decimal I've said that the four will be right shifted by two to the power two. Whatever you write, it will be it will be done in power of two. So that is why I've said in power of two. When you when you uh, right shift a binary uh, binary binary number, when you right shift by one, it is just a division by two. And when you do left shift, okay, Ujjal do be. Yeah, wait, 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 wait. Yeah, now go ahead. How do you know that we are, when we are entering it, the number is going to be a binary number or not? Because for a moment there, I thought this was going to be simple 100. Yeah. So you have to think it as a 100 for the explanation because you might get confused if I write this right shift and if I write this left shift, which one is division and which one is multiplication. So for to remove this confusion, you take a binary number. Okay. And then you write like this. Then you can say, okay, this is a division because this number was 100, which is a larger binary number than one. So it is shifted by two place. Okay. Or if you write number like this and you write shift by three, what happens? So three places will be shifted. So it will be one zero. And this will be dropped one zero and one. It will be dropped. Similarly, if you write this one one and then left shift by two, what happened? One one, one zero zero and zero zero. So in binary, you can clearly see when I write left shift, I will push the eleven towards the left. This one one, not eleven. This one one, I will push the left. And now you can think whether it is a multiplication. Which one is multiplication? Which one is division? when you think an example with binary instead of uh, this decimal. So it will remove the confusion part then. So that was the point. But in C, when 100 is written, consider it as a decimal. So when I, when I write something uh, like int i is equals to 100, it will not be in binary, it will be in decimal. Okay. This, this, this I've done just to uh, kind of remember what is left shift and what is right shift and what happens behind the scene. Actually, there is a register which is stored this number in binary format and register is 8 bit. So when you do right shift, you cannot hold the bit that is going to be left off. Like when you do right shift by two, this zero zero, since it is an 8 bit, so that two bit, if you want to fit, so you need to have 10 bit, but your register is eight bit. So those two bit will be dropped when you do right shift. When you do left shift, then since you have more space over here, it can occupy in two bit, you have six more bit on the left side of this one one. So it can easily have one one and zero zero. But if you go extreme, then this one one may get dropped as well. Okay, so when I say you have 8 bit, so if I shift it uh, by let's say 6, then it will become 1 1 0 0 0 0 0 0, which can uh, any 8 bit register can hold this value. Okay, but if, if I write, it, I write 7, then this one will be dropped and extra 0 will be created. Okay, so that is why I've said that when you write a decimal number, with right shift, with left shift, and whatever value you write over here, the three, four, whatever, it will be multiplied by two to, two to the power of that value. So where does this multiplication and division comes? This binary number clears this out. Okay. So any confusion here? No? Good. 
so and i've also covered this uh, pre increment and uh, post increment this one pre increment post increment plus plus and pre decrement and post decrement right what is the difference between those to i plus plus right sir yeah so, so when you is... write some variable i plus a plus plus or plus plus a the what is the difference in assignment right like in assignment it will first yeah. uh, assign a and then add one in the in the plus plus a it will pl first add one and then like assign yeah so when you call post increment which is this a plus plus the increment will happen after the operation so when you write let's say this uh, y is equals to a plus plus what happen since it is a post increment y will be assigned the value a and then a will be incremented so a will be incremented when this entire uh, statement is executed so this, that is why it is called post increment but when you write y is equals to plus plus a what happen it is since it is a pre increment so value of a will be incremented first and then whatever that incremented value will be returned here okay so that is why it is called pre increment that without performing the operation first increment the value of that variable and post increment say that after performing the uh, the operation increment uh, the value of that variable so this is post and pre increment okay and math function of covered like how to take absolute that is f apps so sir and here in post increment this pre increment plus plus there is this one thing i had a doubt in so basically yeah. in in the first expression a will be assigned to y and then it will be increased and in yeah. the second one is that first the increased value of a will be assigned to y yes a will be increased in and the increased value yeah let me let me uh, break it in multiple statement so when you write y is equals to a plus plus what happens this will happen internally but when you write y is equals to plus plus a this will happen okay here yes sir. yeah so this so that is why it is pre increment then before applying the operation first increment the value of a and this is post increment after applying the operation increment the value of a oh uh, sir yeah sir how do we calculate a, like a time taken for a particular uh, like a piece of code like for example in competitive coding like that matters right like so how do i do that yeah there is a function time when you write time a dot out it will give you the time to take in for the entire program okay but in case of competitive coding you don't need this concept of timing you need to be uh, uh, you need to be smart in your algorithm design they don't care about the absolute time let's say uh, the advanced concept you might not know this so there is an algorithm algorithm calls so in when you do this competitive coding you might uh, see not might you will definitely see that the logic that you have used is kind of requiring order of n square so where n is a number of uh, the input the input size is n now your running time is order of n square okay order of n square can be seen something like this so if i is iterating from 0 to n for and then you have written again one for and then there is a j which is also iterating from 1 to n so you can see for every i there is a j from 1 to n so n into n so order of n square okay so you might be doing some 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 computation in order of n square okay but but here you have to be uh, when you do competitive arcs miss uh, 
Akars, can you hear me? Akars Misra. Akars Misra, can you hear me? No. Okay. So when you so you have to reduce this order of n square to either order of n log n and log n, which is smaller than order of n square, or even possible reduce it to order of n. So that is where timing difference will happen. So in competitive coding, you don't need to be absolute time. You don't need to have the absolute time. Like, okay, my code is four seconds, run kar raha, two seconds, I'm going to run it for two seconds, I'm going to run it for two seconds. You have to be uh, algorithmically. So this is called uh, uh, asymptotic timing. So you have to reduce your logic. So let's say naively you have implemented your code, your, your problem in such a way that it is requiring order of n square in worst case. So this is this order is like in worst case. That is the upper bound of your code. It will take order of n square. But they might be thinking that you have to think little different, and then you come up, you have to come up with n log n. So I've written a code, which is taking n log n, and I've computed that time. If your code is taking n log n, your code should take a time which is near to a my, a my, uh, my execution time. So that is how I check the timing difference. If, it is, if your code is order of n square, then the code that you have written and the code that I have provided as a solution, the timing will not match. Okay. So the, the value of timing does not matter here. The thinking matters. So how you design your code in such a way that your logic is like, uh, instead of n square, it is n log n or order of n. So you might have seen uh, there is a, this sorting algorithm. Okay. So if you compute it naively, it will take order of n square. Yes. But if you do some trick, it can be done in order of n log n. So like that insertion sort, right? Like not insertion sort. Yeah, insertion sort will take order of n square. Insertion sort or bubble sort, it will take order of n square. But if you do this merge sort, it will take n log n. Or there is a variant of quick sort which will take n log n. There is a radix sort or radix sorting also. So there are many sorting algorithm, and the research is always going on to reduce it to maybe order of one someday. <laughs> Not happen. So there is a, this order of one. So irrespective of whatever your input size is, it will always take a constant time. So if your input size is hundred, the time is. 2 millisecond. If your input side is 1 million, the time is still 2 millisecond. So that execution time does not depend on your input sides. So that is why it is called order, order of 1 or order of C, a co a co a co some constant. So let's say if I ask you, if I give you a problem, uh, find uh, the smallest. Uh, not find, find uh, an element in array, okay? You have given an array of, let's say, size capital N. Now you have to scan the array and find the element that I've given you. Let's say your array is having one to 10, and I've asked whether six is there or not. If six is there, then you print yes found. If six is not there, then you print okay, not found. So what would be the the the, the asymptotic uh, the upper bound of your algorithm? How you design it here in this case? It will be n only, right? Like yes, order of n. So the time bound will be order of n. You have to in worst case. So what happens? The size is order of, the size of your array is n. In best case. You might find your element at first position. In average case, you might find your element at middle position. 
in worst case you have to go all the way to your n nth position and you have found your element at nth position so you have to scan entire array to be sure whether that element is present in that array or not okay so that is why this first case or the upper bound of your code would be order of n right uh, but if i add a thing here that your array is sorted either ascending or descending now what would be the uh, the upper bound in that case how you will change your the logic or the code or the algorithm in the in in this case will it be still order of n we can like and convert it in this case n. yeah so let me uh, let me uh, reiterate once again so in this case the array i'm not told anything about the array the array might be sorted it might not be sorted so that is why i have to scan entire array so that is why it is taking order of n but if i say okay array is sorted now what extra you can do such that your execution time can be reduced or it cannot be reduced to order of n that is a, like uh, it cannot be reduced even if array is sorted so yeah so like we can do it half by half right like cut it into two pieces and then cut it again yeah so that is where binary search is born okay so this is called binary search this previous thing that you have done it is called linear search okay this is linear search and this is binary search so in binary search the time complexity it is called time complexity it would be log n so log n is smaller than n and that is why you want fastness in your in your in your mobile or in your web server or in your computer remember there is a this file search you can search your file when you go to file manager you can search your file quickly how there is a this binary search tree and there is a lot of indexing caching and everything to make that fastness otherwise it will be lot lot slower if you do this linear search uh, this is so this is the actual thing here you don't need to have so if the competitive code is asking you to have your upper bound as log n then there is a no no point of having this time how to get the time of your code how what is the running time of your code you don't have to see the exact uh, the, the the absolute value you have to see asymptotically or conceptually how much time it can take uh, if your input input side is uh, n okay uh, so sir? yeah yeah sir, like how is it log n like we are cutting it into two right so it be something like n by 2 to the power something no 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 so yeah so <laughs> is not algorithm course but since for today i don't have many topic to cover so let me explain so there is a this masters theorem so what it say so initially your let's say the time time taken to uh, time taken uh, by your program is tn if input size is n right the array size is n now i don't know the time of uh, that that uh, that code so i have declared it as tn now what you have done you have divided into two part so two now the array size become n by 2 so if for size n your time is tn so for size n by 2 you will take tn by 2 time right yeah similarly if size is i your time taken will be ti right and then there is some constant so this is the expression that you got so you have initially you have size n now you have divided your array and then you have performed some computation that was that is a con in constant time and then you do the computation on n by 2 element instead of n right 
right right right yeah yeah and so then this becomes recursive yeah this becomes recursive and when you solve this you can solve it like uh, on paper it form a nice series of log n but if you want to solve it using a formula so master's theorem comes into picture and it will say okay the time complexity of this uh, this equation or what would be this order of log n okay so you can expand this thing like a series tn is equals to tn by 2 something like this then you compute tn by 2 what will be the value of tn by 2 and you put that tn by 2 over here so using this 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 equation you can compute what is the value of tn by 2 so tn by 2 would be tn by 4 plus this c so you subtract this uh, you put this uh, value of tn by 2 to this then you compute tn by 4 so you can expand this and ultimately it will become log n a series of series which will represent a log n okay but like uh, but like it will become like t by n to the power 2n uh, if like plus some n minus 1c right uh, yeah. yeah but you can say that it is a kind of yeah n minus 1c is kind of order of c yes so, so, so like so, i still don't understand how log okay yeah for that you have to take this algorithm course okay, okay. so it, yes. it it form a nice tree kind of thing. So initially you have n node in that tree. Now next time you will have n n by two node, then again n by four, then n by eight, then n by two to the power four. So when you have four level, you have n n n. Uh, you have how many number of node? You have n by two to the power four at fourth mm -hmm. level. So at log n level, you will have n to the power two log n okay and it will give you n by n so when you do to the power log n and log is a base 2 your log is a base 2 not base 10 so when you do to the power okay. log n it will become n and n n will be uh, cancelled out so you will have just one node so at which height you have got this one node is log n so when that i become so ultimately what you will see is n to the power n by 2 to the power i okay you can see this right yes sir tn by 2 tn by 4 yeah, tn yeah, by yeah. 8 right so ultimately when your array contain one element then you can be sure okay if that element is matching with the given element then that can be written as a found so that is where you can stop right and that the condition that at which you will stop is the i thing when this i become log n, this total it power log n one. become n, and n n will be divided, and the value of that and that, that the array size become one. Oh, so the height yes. of yeah, so the height of that tree would be log n, and the time complexity of that would be log n. So in a kind of uh, abstract way, I've, I've explained that there is a formal thing to be done here. Okay. Yes, sir. Yeah, so someone else was saying something. So in your competitive coding, you have to be uh, you have to be very attentive what is given. If I is sort, if I is given, whether it is sorted or not, whether I can use something like binary search or not. So you can accordingly reduce your search space. Uh, not search space, the running time. Obviously, the sus space. Initially, the sus space is n. Now it is n by two. So this is there's the like best. Yeah, yeah. There's something called selection sort also, right? Yes, yeah, selection sort will also take uh, order of n square. So what is selection sort? Selection sort is like so. How you will sort an an array? So you have array of size n. What would be the best or the naive or the the, the, the first thing that you can do? Okay, I will pick the minimum in this entire array by scanning it linearly. I will pick first minimum and I will store it in some other array at the first position. Then I will pick up pick second minimum and then I will store it at the second position of that new result array. So there is this result array and there is this input array. 
So every time I will pick the minimum, first minimum, second minimum, third minimum, fourth minimum, and I will arrange it in that uh, that result array. So first minimum will go to first position, second minimum will go to second position, third minimum will go to third position. Okay. So when you do this, so uh, finding the minimum is order of n time. So you can scan entire array to find the minimum element in that array. So that is order of n. And since you have to find minimum, uh, first minimum, second minimum, third minimum, n times, so that will become order of n square. So that is why it is called selection sort, that you are selecting. So selecting either minimum or maximum, depending upon how you want to sort your uh, array, ascending or descending. Okay. okay yes, sir. Yeah, so there is this bubble sort. So why yes, bubble? Sir. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Please go ahead. Uh, sir, um, like uh, how many types of complexity uh, are mm -hmm. there? Like there is big O for the worst case. And yeah. uh, there is this where... big O. Yeah, there is this big O, which is like worst way or worst uh, time. There is this best case, which is denoted as omega. So currently, I don't have any key for this on my keyboard. So this is omega, like best case. And then there is an average case, which is denoted by a small o. So on an average, this uh, how much time it will take. So remember, I've told that when you have to find an element, in best case, you can find it in omega of 1. At first position, you have found the element. In worst case, what will be the upper bound? It will be order of n. So the upper bound in worst case give you the upper bound. So in worst case, you have to go at the last of the array and then you can say whether your element is there or not. So that is order of n, capital O. And there is a, this omega, like what, what could be the lower bound? It would be omega of one. In one go, you can find, okay, I found it in just one comparison. So that is omega, best case. And then there is an average. So if you combine all this thing that, okay, I found at middle, I found two element before the middle element or two of element after the two position of, after the middle position. So with this, you can compute, okay, this is a kind of a small O of n by two. So on average, it will take n by two. Uh, so, so these are only for uh, time or both time and space, sir? No, no this is uh, for time. Similarly, you can derive the same thing for space as well. So if you, space is like very simple. If you take an array, which is of size n, then space would be order of n. If you have taken 2D array of size this much, then space would be order of n square. So space is how you, you are using your variables. That is space. Space is like you can see in your code. But the time, this time complexity, you have to be uh, very, very careful. Sometimes you can see it straightforward by seeing the loop. If there are two loops of n size, then it is order of n square. But sometimes you have to be something like this. So you have to form an equation and then you have to solve with master's theorem. It will give you, okay, this is order of n. Order of log n. So this, this time complexity take, uh, uh, much time to get, but this space uh, this space complexity is like a very very simple thing. Sometimes we don't care about space. We have lot of RAM, lot of room, but it don't, we don't have uh, that much time. Okay. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, sir, uh, I was uh, uh, like this may uh, sound off topic for now. But like yeah. uh, I was curious about like I was reading about it complexities mm -hmm. uh, a while ago and I saw a problem and like uh, I think it is one of the uh, millennial problems I guess uh, it states that... so, like, what was the yeah what was the problem the statement uh, problem uh, name uh, of... the the name of the problem was I guess P versus N P and uh, okay, uh, yeah. like. There was a like uh, I don't actually remember what it said, but like uh, it stated that uh, if a problem can be solved in 
polynomial uh, time and polynomial space yeah. then it is classified into p and yes. if it like uh, breaks into exponential then it is np non polynomial i guess yeah kind of but uh, let's say when you say that it can be solved in polynomial time you want to say the n to the power m so m can vary so m could be 1 2 3 4 5 5 or log n so these all are polynomial time algorithm so you can see the result in real time but if it is exponentiation like 2 to the power of that or e to the power of n to the power of something so it is kind of np so there are nice concept of p and np and uh, i can give you a problem so a uh, sir yeah so like the so let's say, e let's say you want to check you want to check uh, this is like very debatable thing p versus np whether p is equals to np or not it is not clear till today uh, but let's say you want to compute you want to check whether a given number the number could be very large whether it is prime or not so that is also a very open problem in computer science whether a number is prime or not in theoretically it is proved that okay there is a paper primes in p written by madinda grawal nitin saxena and uh, there is a one more guy in our department so they have kind of uh, got a very good uh, result so they have declared that okay primes can be a verified whether the number is prime or not in polynomial time so they have written a paper primes in p which has kind of changed many thing but in practical practical uh, because the assumptions that is used in that paper cannot be drawn practically so in practically it is still not feasible to verify whether the number is prime or not if you can verify it then you can break a uh, many uh, security assumptions rsa dsa all this uh, security protocol and that is why there is a field like quantum computer it can do lot of computation in very less time so it can break those uh, public private keys okay. so if you are interested in those thing uh, do attend this cryptology course in your maybe second year or third year you will enjoy yes so this is kind of off topic but quickly let me wrap up uh, what i want to tell today okay we can discuss this later if you are interested we can discuss it uh, maybe uh, 15 minute after uh, i discuss something okay so there is a this enum construct in c what it does let's say you want to group your error messages in a kind of more human readable thing so you write something like uh, error underscore x error underscore y so all kind of error can be grouped here so for now i'm writing error x y z but you can write actual error value over here so you can write something like sec fault the right error okay sec fault fault or you can write error this error is like uh, pointer related thing pointer day referencing or null pointer or something like that so this way you can group your error and similarly you can compare it so with some variable let's say there is a this this uh, this int result you've called some function i will explain the function today so you've called some function uh, which is function x function underscore x and then you pass some parameter let's say uh, variable b it has returned something so if result is equals to error underscore x then you can do something you can print something and similarly you can compare result with other errors so what is the value of this error x so when you do do not write anything over here so by default whatever you write in enum the first thing would be zero and then subsequent thing would be plus plus one so it would be zero plus one which is one it would be one plus one which is two so zero it will be start from zero zero one 
two, three, four. So when you print this value, so you can also do this thing. You can print it something like. Printf. The voice just sped very fast. Like it went very fast. Right? Maybe it was okay, okay, okay. Maybe okay, 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 okay. So what happens? Did the screen freeze? No, no, no. Now is it visible, Prago? Now it is visible. So earlier I had written, I, I don't know why okay. in my section of the hostel, I don't know why the Wi-Fi is fluctuating a lot. Okay, okay. So when you declare there is this is enum construct, it is used to declare some constant that you can refer in your code. So it is a kind of more human readable thing. So let's say I want to group all the errors. So I've written enum and grouped all the errors that can be encountered in this program and named it. So by default, the value of error X would be zero. The value of error Y would be one. The value of error Z would be two. Similarly, this would be three, this would be four. So whatever you declare, uh, whatever you write inside enum, the first thing would be always zero. And then plus one, plus one, plus one, something like this. So this error X would be zero. This error Y would be a one. This would be two. This would be three. This would be four. So when you the print value this, of the errors. yes, yes, the value of that, this thing. Sir, how do we write error? What, like, what do we write in that error? Like Exactly, sir, I didn't get that part. You don't have to write anything here. So let's say you have called a function over here. Okay. Now you want to check whatever value that is returned by this function, whether it is matching with the error value or not. Let's say it is returning a, an error code, okay? And uh, I've declared kind of no error. So if result is having the value, no error, then you can terminate your program and you can say, okay, there is a no error in this, or you can perform a lot of computation, okay? Depending upon the error, you can show the message. So this is how you can group all the errors. So since it is a constant, so it should have some value. When you want to compare it, it cannot be a string. You can see this is not a string. This is a kind of symbol inside enum, which will have an integer value always. So this no error by default, what will be the value of all these uh, this, this, uh, this, this symbols? It uh, first thing would be zero, then one, then two, then three, then four, then five, the value of all these things. Okay. Then if you print, so let me print it instead of saying it. So when you print this error X, the value would be one. The value would be one, right? Like any arbitrary error will be considered as that as that error x. Like yeah, I mean, I mean, for the example, I'm telling you what how this enum construct look like. What how you can like, use I it understand for... how we write that. Like if you want to specify that particular error as that like, one. For thing. example, runtime error is by one. Yeah. Yeah, like you can error. specify this error x as a runtime error. Okay. But how do we do that, sir? That's like we need to memorize like. Uh, names right then yeah you have to memorize obviously since okay. you are you are you are considering that you will consider all kind of error you have written all kind of error okay and then you are comparing all kind of error over here but it is it is a nicer way it is a nicer way to say okay i have all this error runtime error blah error y error z error sec fault null all this error predefined okay and then i am comparing it with that error name instead of comparing result equal to equal to one then i will say okay this is uh, set fault error or runtime error it is less readable less understandable but if you write here result is equals to error runtime so if someone is reading your code uh, he can uh, or she can clearly see okay you are comparing whatever is returned with some error value and that error value is a runtime error. 
So you can so directly, yeah. Each and every error in like C has a particular name that we have to put in enum. Yes, yes, yes. So, so like, can control. you have a list of the, those errors? Like, no, no, you cannot have. Let, uh, let me remove this topic of error here. Okay. You can write something like this. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And you can use it. How you are going to use it will depend on your logic, on your code. This Monday will be a zero. The value of this Monday, uh, M1, this Q would be one. Similarly, this would be two, three, four, five, six. Okay, so it automatically assigns numbers. That's all it numbers. does. Numbers. Yes. Numbers to this set of variable, like names. Names. Right. Whatever right. you write here. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So like so. And then you like, can use these numbers. Yeah. But still, like there will be particular errors, like names, right? Yeah, I mean there would be. You can group your error messages, or let's say in your code there are multiple regions. So let me let me let me define it. How compile uh, compiler define things? Inside compile inside when you write a program, there are various segment of your program. There is it is data segment. There is it is heap segment. There are other kind of also segment. So next segment and. All this thing okay so there is a, this function which is returning segment type and you have to check whether your segment type is data if it is data segment then you don't do not handle this page fault if it is heap segment which is dynamically allocated thing then you handle page fault so this is kind of advanced uh, thing what is page fault and all this thing but uh, it is kind of nicer way to handle things instead of writing, okay, compare it with one, and then I will assume that if you compare it one, then it will be data. So in future, if you add some more segment, let's say I've added some segment, uh, segment Y. Now the value of data is still valid. So I'm still comparing the same thing, segment data. Let's say in, in, in some file I've compared uh, the result, uh, result of, whatever a variable with this segment data. So that uh, the segment data is still valid. And the value is changed to one instead of, uh, instead of zero previously. But if you do not write like this, then what you have to do, whatever. So in places where you have written segment data, you have to edit it and make it one. Okay. So that is how this enum can be used. So you will not use enum in competitive coding uh, in any course, I guess, but in compiler or in OS, you might have to use this uh, enum construct. Otherwise, it is not very usable in, in, in academic courses. It is very, very usable in software coding, general purpose softwares. So this enum is clear, right? Yes. Let me cover a topic yes, to overflow. Specify, to specify error specifically. Not to specify error, you can specify anything, a particular constant, and that constant will have some value. There is a one more uh, thing in the enum itself. So remember I've written this uh, X and then Y and then Z, okay? So by default, this X is having zero. This Y is one, this Z is two. But if you write x is equals to maybe 10, then x would be 10, y would be 11, z would be 12. Similarly, if you write minus 23, this would be minus 22, this would be minus 21. Okay. So this like is the this enough. Is a faster way to assign values to variables, right? Like it is not a variable. Not, not variable like it is a constant. Yeah, faster way yeah. to assign a constant. Yeah. Yes. You can have a dot h file of all the enum in some other dot h, and you can include that dot h for in every file that you want to use that enum. 
that time okay so currently it is hard for me to show you the real example because the time is like time complexity thing is coming into picture <laughs> okay so let me cover this overflow so it is clear now what is like enum construct how the practical uses of this i will explain in some other class okay yes sir so there is a, this overflow what happens let's say i've declared a b and c and i've written c is equals to a plus b so what is overflow let's say the value of a is int max so what uh, whatever the max value that a can have an integer can have okay and this b is let's say one now when you add the maximum value that integer can hold with plus one this is called overflow because now integer cannot hold a value beyond int max so there is a this micro int max these are constant this is defined by the compiler right so you can declare uh, define all this thing in a kind of uh, enum thing so you write enum int max and you start with uh, that uh, you assign a variable uh, you assign a constant to int max so a would be, if a is int max then if you add b and the b is 1 even if the b is 1 now since you know that this addition is done on integer so the final result will be inside integer range but in int max plus 1 would not be inside integer range so this incident is called integer overflow so it is overflowing your space you cannot hold uh, the new computed value in that space so what will happen so it will be int max plus one so what will happen here it could have a zero it could have some garbage value depending on the compiler okay so this is called overflow so apparently this is called integer overflow because it happens with the integer similar thing can happen with any any data type because everything is having some limit and you can overflow that limit anyhow so these are some security bugs it's overflow which people avoid So how can you check? How can you check? So how you can avoid this overflow? Let's say I want to avoid it, right, How? The condition on a. Sir, actually there's a little bit of lag. Here. Could you just tell once more? Actually, that this. Okay. So let's say problem. there are three variables a, b, c. You are taking the value of a and b from user. Okay. And then you are computing c. As, uh, as a plus b and i've said that if a is int max which is the maximum value that an integer can hold and you have uh, added let's say one or two or ten so it will overflow because you cannot hold that new computed value in a range in an integer space okay but why can't we hold it sir uh why can't you hold it similar to Okay, you have read this number system, right? Let's say you have four bit, four bit register. Not register, consider it as a box. Okay. Now this is first bit, second bit, third bit, fourth bit. What could be the maximum value of number that uh, decimal number that you can you can you can represent using four bit? So remember in binary. Only zero and one is possible, right? So you can initialize one, 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 one to all four bits, and it will become fifteen. Okay. So this is maximum value that a four-bit value can have. But if you add fifteen plus one, it will become sixteen, which is one and four times zero. 
Yes. Now, if you have four bit register, so you cannot have this one one extra bit inside that, right? Because you you do not have a space for it, right? So we have a variable which can only store a particular type, particular number of registers using certain registers. If we increase that, then there is a problem. Yes. So in first class or second class, I've told that you see, it is a data type. There is a maximum limit for every data type. So integer will take two byte. Character is having one byte. Float is having four byte. Double is having eight byte. Something like this. So it depends. It varies on different compiler, but that is like kind of uh, a general thing. That character will take one byte. One byte means eight bit. So one byte is equals to eight bit, and uh, a bit. Can be zero or one in binary. So if if you have written something, this is taking nine byte, and you have assigned it to a character. So since you know that character can hold only eight eight bit, that is one byte. Now that ninth byte will be uh, will be dropped. You cannot store it. Right. So see, like this, consider or byte. ninth bit. Okay, yes. So I said that character is a one byte, which is equivalent to eight bit. So one bytes is equals to eight bit. One KB is equals to two to the power 10 bytes. So might have uh, no obviously, no. Yes. So in K, you multiply with two to the power 10 which is 1024. But if you write, like you can see on YouTube, there is a 4K view. So you do not multiply there to the power 10, you multiply with 1000 instead of 1024. But in computers, whatever is there, we multiply with to the power 10. So if you write this capital K, you multiply with to the power 10. If you write a small K, then you multiply with 1000. So K is kind of 1000. But in computer, it is to, to the power 10. When you write one MB, similarly, it will become two to the power ten KB. Okay, this is one zero two four KB, and you can then convert KB to byte, something like this. Then you can compute the one GB. So one GB would be one zero two four MB. One TB, one TB is one two one zero two four and GB. Is equals to one dB and then one petabyte something like this. So there is a space uh, restrictions everywhere. So when you when I've said that you cannot add fifteen with one, what could be the the possible value here? It could have a zero. That one would be dropped, or the one is added somewhere here and it is returning some garbage value. So that is also a possibility. Sure. Yeah. Sir, like in uh, speed test, we have like two different MBP, like MB capital MB per second and small MBPS. Like yes. Yeah, so when you when you talk about a small M, that is million, ten power six. Like one million uh, rupees or one million dollar, that is ten power six. Okay. So I've said that when it is K, small K, that is ten to the power three. When it is capital K, that would be two to the power ten. So when you see something in capital, trigger your CS uh, inside your brain that, okay, this is two to the power 10, not 10 to the power three. So M is like million, which is 10 to the power six in case of small M. So when you talk about this, uh, this, this thing, uh, the speed, okay. So in the speed, like what is the speed of LAN? You may encounter like this GPPS gigabits per second so this giga is like 10 power 6 9. into 10 power 3 which is 10 power 9. so that is only small right but you're saying when it's capital it will 10 to the power 10 2 to the power 10 right? yeah but like for advertisement they write like this syntactically it should be like this okay. company mary <laughs> okay. yeah so this So, but yes, in, in your exam, if you see 
small k, treat it as 10 to the power 3. But if you see capital K, treat it as 2 to the power 10. So that is the mnemonics here. Now, when you add this 15 with 1, it will be 16, which is 100, zero zero, but you have 4 bit register. So this one will be dropped. Now, similar thing will happen over here. Let's say A is having some max value. And now you add one to that max value. So that uh, that thing will be dropped and it will return zero or it can return garbage. But my question is how to prevent this, uh, this, this overflow? Let's say I want to have something in my code which will say, okay, this is a condition of overflow and I will not compute this A plus B if it is overflow. So how to check it? Anyone? So like, uh, like we use that enum, right? So can't we use that? Yeah, you can use it how? How you can use it? So like put, uh, if like uh, C is equal to A plus B, it doesn't, it doesn't give an error. Okay, 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 fine. It will not give an error, okay. It will give a garbage error, right? Yeah, yeah. So like put a greater than uh, some like if, if okay. yeah tell me if c is greater than that uh, int max int no no max. no 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 that's wrong that's wrong sorry sorry no 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 you have already computed it yeah 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 you have to avoid this computation so like a and b are user right yeah it is obtained from the user and these are two integers. I've told you a case where A could be int max and B is one. There is also all, there are many possibilities that A could be int max by two and B is int max by two plus one, right? That is also a case of overflow. That there could be many cases of overflow. But in case of overflow, you have to prevent it. You don't have to calculate it. You don't want to calculate C is equals to A plus B. If you know beforehand that, okay, A plus B is going to be overflow. But the problem is how you will get to know that A plus B is overflow. Like A plus B minus int max is greater than zero. But again, you have computed A plus B. Right, okay. So can you do it without computing a plus b? That is the point here. So you know the range, right? You know the int min. And the index. So now let's say A will always fall in this range. Obviously, it has to fall because it is an integer. So it is falling in this range. Now, with this information, can you can you check the value of B for the overflow of A plus B? A minus impact. Int max minus A. Yeah, int max minus A. So B could be ranging from where to where? Uh, int min minus A to int max. No, int max minus A to. B would be ranging from int max minus A, minus A to. Int. So this is the upper, upper range. Int min plus go. A. Int min. Int min plus A. Sir, int min plus A? Yeah, someone said that int min plus A. Because there is this int max minus A, so <laughs> similarly this is int, int min plus A. Huh? Why so what is the logic behind this int min plus A? 
we can't do infinite infinite minus a make that makes no sense so no sense like this <laughs> is stupid so if some some number is falling in a range and you want to compute whether the other number the addition of this number with the other number should also fall in this range so how to ensure this what would be the value of this uh, this b so this is correct b is less than or equals to in max minus a it should be infinite minus a so infinite minus, minus a, a only. only like so the yeah. simple thing is like we need to add so infinite 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 is like uh, this thing uh, the minimum value that integer can hold let's say that is minus 99999 let's say that is minus 999 that is the int min and let's say int max is 999 so int min is having minus 999 int max is having plus 999 now a is ranging from here to here Now what could uh, apply to b such that a plus b is not going to produce integer then it will be int min only not minus here nothing so it will be int min only so by in simple words a plus b should lie between int max and int min right 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 so then yeah. it's basically int min is lesser than or equal to a plus b is lesser than or equal to int max we subtract a on all sides so that so there will be a minus a only that's int min minus a makes no sense because that is yeah, yeah let me let me let me let me do it like your method sir a minus int min can we write that yeah let me write it so he said that a plus b should be ranging from uh, ranging from this to this right so i want to check the condition over b so let me subtract a from both all the sides so therefore from everywhere be, and as atulia said there will be just that doesn't make sense so therefore there will be int min only int underscore yeah. min that's like the smallest one possible why it does not make any sense this int it's min a, minus sir a. something how can b be less than like why will b be less than int min minus a like it it's already over like underflow overflow underflowing right so it will be in min like this yeah yes but then there is a catch here let's say the value of uh, this int a is equals to int min okay and then b is also int min B is uh, let's say uh, not int min, because it will detect. Uh, okay, okay, yeah. Min. Is it overflow? A plus B in this case. Yeah, it will because int min and int min both are negative. Generally. But your condition is passing here, right? Yeah. So is int min negative? Yeah, it's minus something. Minus nine ninety nine, and even consider this is a uh, this is this is nine ninety nine, and you are subtracting nine ninety nine with minus nine nine ninety nine. Now it will increase the upper limit of B here if A is negative. So it will be conditional, right? Like conditional. It depends. Yeah, it will be conditional, eight, but it will be zero. Then, sir, yes. int min ka minimum value also. Right? So, if we subtract a, which is negative, then also yeah. it will work. It might work, right? No, it will not work. If a is negative, then it will be added, right? No, int max plus that. No, int min wala part. Now, here we said minus a, int min underscore minus a. The LHS here, sir. This one. This one. So you want to subtract a with here, this? Here. Okay, okay, okay. Let me. So let me just remove that. So, so. Yeah, remove this. Huh. So you want to do like this, right? You want to do like this. So what if a is negative? Yeah. So if a is negative, then it will perfectly work. The lower bound will be kind of. Uh, 
So the upper bound will break lowered, but the upper bound will break. But if A is positive, okay. So therefore, that's the condition. Lower bound will be yeah. Yeah. So if A is positive here, then upper bound is okay, but lower bound will be further lowered. Yeah. If A is positive here, let's say this int min can go minus nine ninety nine, right? Now, if you say that A is one. Then this upper bound is okay. The B can have maximum into max minus one, but the lower bound is saying that you can go up to minus one thousand. This is wrong. So then, uh, shall we divide it from into min to zero and then from zero to into max? Like Sir, like we will have to take care about the conditions also. So shouldn't uh, the range be broken and then we put conditions? Yes. Otherwise, yes, this problem to, will come. Yes, you need to consider this a. So whether a is positive or a is negative, then accordingly you will change your condition. Yes. Yes, sir. So you can see this overflow is like very complex thing. And to give you the correct thing, is like complicated. Okay. But I guess this should work. Why it was not working? This should work, na? Because according to mathematics, if a plus b is lying in this range, then we can subtract a from all the side, and this should be the the range for b. But there is according another inequality also. That B is from int min to int max. That also equality we have to take care. Yes, 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 right. Okay, so that is why it is breaking. So I want to know the reason behind this simple equality, because there is a, this constraint on the space that B should be min to max. In mathematics, there is a no constraint on the space. Anything can have any value, but yeah, because B has to be less than this int min and max. Now you can see that first you have to check the value, the sign of a, and accordingly you have to formulate the condition for b, right? Yes, sir. Yeah. So that is so a what, overflow thing. So what is yeah. the range of int, sir? Minus nine ninety nine two. No, no, no. This is not actual range. Actual range is like this. So as I just said that int take two bytes. So could you say two that again? So int takes always two bytes. The size of int is two bytes. Okay, sixteen bits on maximum machine. So how many bit it will uh, have? Sixteen. Sixteen. Sixteen bits. So this is on thirty-two bit machine. On sixty-four bit machine, it take four, four. bytes. So it will be how many bits? Sixty-four. Thirty-two. Right. Eight into oh, four. Sorry. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and in case of thirty-two bit, you want to have. So, what is the uh, what is the upper limit that you can present with thirty-two bit? Two power thirty-two minus one. Minus one. Yes. Yeah. So, read this number system uh, video. So, two power thirty-two minus one. That is the upper uh, value that you can present with all ones, and then. The zero you can have all zeros on thirty-two bit, so you can represent a number from zero to two to the power thirty-two minus one using thirty-two bit, right? But it is just representing zero to two to the power thirty-two minus one. I want to represent the negative number as well, right? Because integer will take in negative value. It it doesn't always take a positive value. It can take negative value. But here, so I have to assign some combination to negative value, and then some combination out of all this combination. So possible combination would be two to the power thirty-two, right? So in thirty-two bit, so let's say you have thirty-two bit positions here, and you can fill these positions using zero and one. So the possible combination would be two into two into two into two into. So it will lead to two to the power thirty-two. Right. This is the possible combination of all the binary digit, which is zero and one. So with thirty-two places, you can have this much uh, combination. Now, 
So if the negative numbers, that will be two to the power thirty one, right? Because like uh, that minus will also take a space. Yes. No, no, minus will not take any space. So oh, how you will? Uh, yes. So how you will? Uh, so how you will divide your number? So if first bit, which is the uh, most significant, it is called most significant. So this first bit, first bit from uh, left. This is called most significant bit of any 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 bit pattern. So if you take first bit from the leftmost, it will be most significant bit. It is called as MSP, most significant bit. And if you take the first bit from the rightmost, it is called least significant bit. So there is a concept of most significant bit and least significant bit. Is it clear what is MSP and what is LSP? Most no, MSB is basically from the leftmost, right, sir? Yeah. So when you write a binary number, the leftmost bit is called MSB. And when you when you go to the rightmost, so what do I mean by leftmost, rightmost? Let's say you have represented one zero one zero. This is the binary representation of ten. Okay. Now, what is MSB here? This one is MSB. So when you go leftmost, so this one become MSB, and this zero become LSB. So this is LSB. This is MSB. So in in extreme cases. So how to represent minus number as well as plus number? What you could do is something like this. I will represent the first bit of MSB. Will tell me the sign of the number. If it is zero, then that number is positive. If it is one, then that number is negative. So with this rule, if I say that first bit of the MSB most significant bit, so I will come here. So this is the first bit of MSB, and this is first bit of LSB. So when I talk about MSB, I will come from here. So this is first bit of MSB. So it is saying that one. So if that uh, that MSB is one, then that sign is negative. And if that MSB is zero, then that sign is positive. So I will treat this number as minus two. So I will take binary representation of whatever is written in uh, in the next three digit, uh, next three bit, and the next three bit. The representation for this would be minus two. But if I write zero one one one, then it will it will become same because the MSB is zero. Similarly, if I write one one one, it will become minus one. So this is called encoding. So I have. Two to the power four combination using four bit, so which is sixteen. Out of which I've reserved one bit from the MSB to indicate the sign. If it is zero, then that will be treated as plus. So the next uh, next three bit would be converted to decimal, and it will be treated to plus, like positive value. If it is one, then that sign would be negative. Right. Now. There so total numbers will be two to the power thirty-two, right? All integers, like negative yeah, and all, positive. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, okay. Here, yeah, here yeah, all yeah. integers could be two to the power thirty-two, but out of this, the int max and int min value would be something like this. So if you encode like this, this is called like once complement something. So okay, I'm going to put it once here. So if you encode like this, so tell me the value of this. And this using this rule, I will apply this encoding rule. So tell me the value of this. Zero and zero both. This is minus zero, right? So that's zero only, right? No, it will not understand what is zero. Oh, okay, okay, right, right, right. Ha ha ha. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes. So this is minus zero and this is plus zero, right? But sir, that is actually right. we know that that's the same thing, right? Yes, Divyansi. If you have a time like five minute, then yeah, we can uh, uh, we can go to your question. But okay, just wait a little bit. Yeah, go ahead. 
you were saying something zero yeah. uh, so for the zero plus, yeah plus zero minus zero they basically the same thing right so they, so when we yeah in mathematics about... it is same thing but you are you are telling uh, the machine that okay apply this rule that first bit of msp if it is zero then treat whatever number are written treat it as a as a as a positive value and first bit that uh, if it is one then whatever number are written here treat it as a negative value so you have applied this rule to them to a machine now machine does not have any emotion does not have any any, any intelligence so it will see blindly go okay what is msp here msp is zero okay i will treat it as a plus zero then and i will treat this as a minus zero okay clear so we will still say that the total number of numbers available for us is 2 power 4 total okay. combination available is 2 to the power 4 out of yeah. which the the exact number would be 2 to the power 4 by 2 which is 2 to the power 3 why exact number as in sir so uh, exact number means uh, and the positive and negative. So it, using four bit, you can go up to minus seven to seven. Exactly right. So, so you have to. Do you have a total of two? And you have. Yes. You have a total of because you have minutes. reserved. Yeah, because you have reserved this first bit as a sign. Right. So that is how this encoding happens, and you have two values for the zero. Then you apply extra thing. Okay, treat plus zero and minus zero as the same value. So essentially, you have used this first rule that treat first uh, MSB of the, the first bit of MSB as a sign. And then you have encountered error. Then you are telling machine, okay, okay, okay. Treat this plus zero and minus zero as a zero because zero cannot have a plus or minus. So see how many rules you are adding here. And you are wasting one pattern. You can, if there exists something more, you can save this pattern. And you can increase your size here. You can go up to minus seven to uh, seven to minus eight. Okay. If you represent this number as minus eight. If you encode this one zero zero as minus eight. Then using four bit, you can go up to from seven to minus eight, and that is the actual thing. That's a, that 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 is called two's complement. So I did not get this last part. Yeah. So previously this was the thing, now. So you have got now okay. What is the maximum uh, positive integer with four bit? It is zero, and make all ones. Then you help you you will have the maximum positive integer, which is plus seven, right? Yes. Now for the maximum negative uh, integer, not maximum, the lowest negative integer, make it one, make your uh, sign bit as one, and make all ones. Then you will test the lowest negative, which is minus seven, and then you have resolved this plus zero minus zero accordingly because you have used this rule that okay first bit will be treated as uh, sign. So it will say, okay, this is plus zero, this is minus zero. But you know that in zero is, zero cannot be plus zero or minus zero. Zero is zero. It does not have plus or minus. Okay. So, so for, essence. yeah, essentially you are wasting one bit pattern. This is a bit pattern. This is a combination. So you are giving zero two combinations right here. So zero, zero, yes. zero, you have given plus zero. And then one zero zero, you have your minus zero, right? So then again, you will apply one rule that treat plus zero and minus zero as zero. Sorry, sir. Treat plus zero and add zero. So if you if the output is plus zero, so it zero. If output is minus zero, so it as zero. If output, if the result that, so there is a, this arithmetical logical unit that is an actual hardware which perform addition and division and subtraction and many things. Okay. So while computing the result, if you found positive number, so so it as a seven, not plus seven right? for the user convenience. 
So when you write seven, it is a kind of uh, implicit that it is plus seven. When you write minus seven, then you say, okay, this is a negative number. So this is for user convenience that if it is plus seven, then show it as a seven. If it is minus seven, then show it as a seven. Similarly, if it is plus zero, then show it as a zero. If it is minus zero, then show it as a minus zero. If you apply that rule, but here you have to enforce one more if condition, kind of think it as a if condition that if you encounter this bit pattern from the result or this bit pattern, return it as 0, 0, 0, 0, such that plus 0 can be converted to 0. Right? And the actual result will be shown to you will be 0, even if the computation is giving to 1, 0, 0, 0. So essentially, we have total about 31 minus one also, right? Minus one integers because at plus zero and minus zero become one. So yeah, wait, wait for it, wait for it, wait for it. How many integer the the int max and int min? Uh, I will I will come to that point. Now, if you somehow say that okay, so you have got this point now. Ki one zero zero is kind of wasted. Minus zero is not needed, right? Everyone got the point. Yes, and basically we encode it as min and we encode it minus as minus eight. One. Minus eight. I will encode it minus eight. Yes. Because I've I've gone from minus one to minus seven. Mm. Okay. With this, I can go to minus eight. Why I want to encode it as a minus? Because the sign is sign is always one. one. So I cannot I cannot encode it to eight because that rule will be broken. You are saying that I'm having a rule which is saying that first bit of MSP if it is one then blindly say that sign is negative, right? So if you if you assign this, if you increase, try to increase this, uh, the maximum uh, positive value, which is plus eight, you cannot do it. You are breaking that rule. So I will do it like this. So it is not breaking that rule. So I will, since it is a minus, so I will assign minus eight. So that is how now, with four bit box or four bit uh, four bit uh, this storage, I can go up to minus eight to seven. Similarly, so you have understood this part. How you have gone to minus eight to seven? Yes. Only that one number is encoded as minus eight instead of minus zero. Minus zero because minus zero is not needed, right? So that one bit pattern. This is a bit pattern or combination of bit. This is treated as minus eight. So with this, I've increased the, the lower limit of this. So I've increased the number that I can represent using four bit essentially. Before it was minus seven to seven. Now it is minus eight to seven. Okay. See the minus thing is creating a lot of problems here. So now think about float. It will create a hell lot of problem when you are going to represent a float. So with this 32 bit, you have to report 32 combination. Now, can someone tell me the, the, the negative range of the integer and the positive range of the integer? Two Anyone? To the power 31, two to the power 31 plus minus one. Eat right. Here it will be uh, not to the 31 only, no? not, not to the power 31 minus one, it would be something like this. It will be only to the power 31. No, this is minus eight now. Yes, sir. Two so power that's three. two to the power three. Oh, yeah, right, 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 right. Sorry, yeah, yes. And this and now will here be it would be to the power 31, the power 31 minus, one. minus one. So here you have increased one, one pattern. Because you are essentially treating this one zero 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 as a negative number rather than minus zero. So there is a, this nice concept called one's complement and two's complement. So when you apply all the all the operation using two's complement, then this bit pattern is automatically treated as minus eight. But if you are using one's complement, then this bit pattern is treated as minus zero. That is why in today's computer, 
we use two's complement to perform any uh, subtraction addition or anything instead of one's complement. So these doubt will be cleared in kind of uh, architecture course, computer organization and architecture in uh, CS. But it is not needed for programming. But yeah, that is an internal thing. So see how difficult to represent a negative number. Now think about how difficult it will be to represent a, a point or floating point number. And with proper precision. So yeah, these are uh, things. So any doubt? No, sir. No, sir. So now you can pinpoint what is the exact uh, exact range here and why this range is uh, there. It cannot have any other range. Right. So, uh, so is, is this yeah. variable from computer to computer? Or like, like, I mean, like if you have a 16 bit computer, then it will have like two to the power. Yes. Yes, 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 yes. So, as I've said, that if you have this 32 bit, in 32 bit computer, it has two bytes integer. And accordingly, this pattern will change. If, if you it have. It's called 32 bit, then why do you have two bytes? It is by default. So, that, that's just terminology used. Yes. So, in. in so in previously it was 16 bit. So first thing, so int was like one byte in that 16 bit. Okay. Int is taking half of that. So int was like eight, eight bit thing. But when you uh, come to this 16 bit, it was still eight bit. So it was one byte. But when you increase the size 16 to 32, size is increasing in the power of kind of two. So when you go to 16 to 32, you duplicate that byte. So previously it was one byte. Now it will take one byte in uh, first 16 and then other 16 bit. So it is kind of two byte. And then when you go to 64, that two byte is kind of duplicated. So it will also multiply. So it will be, it, it become four. Now, if you go to 128 bit, which is a future or on some machine it is there. So you will have eight, eight bytes. So, but in generally, Int is like two byte, care is one byte, and, uh, and this floating point number is uh, four byte. So this you're telling for 32 bit architecture, right? And this is for 32 bit, yes. So could you say care again once? So character is always one byte. Character uh, byte is not increased, I guess, in 64 bit, but I have to be sure whether it is increased in 64 bit or not. And float is four bytes. Or uh, float is four byte in thirty two bit. In case of sixty four bit, float is eight byte. Is how many? Eight byte. Eight byte. Yes. And so if you you can you can see yeah if you can see that if you increase the storage size, you can have more uh, combination, and implicitly you can have more numbers to represent. And you need more numbers to represent in uh, while performing any scientific computation or something like that. So yeah, those things are needed. So, like scientists have to, be, have to be careful about what kind of computer they're using, like because this is variable from computer to computer, right? Like, so yes, yes. So there is a, this array comes into picture. So let's say, let's say you want to multiply two number A into B. Divyansi, I will go to your doubt. Just uh, one more a minute more. So let's say you are computing C is equals to A into B, and this A and B is having the highest value that an integer can hold on that machine. It can have a, it can happen on 64 bit. It can happen with 128 bit machine. It can happen on any machine. That A and B is having the highest value. Now, while performing this A into B, you want to perform the A into B and store the result in C. You want to do the computation. You don't want to avoid it. Okay, so how you will do it? That is the point. In scientific uh, world, you have to do it. How you will do it? There are many computation that is giving integer overflow or any kind of overflow, like floating point uh, multiplication division. It gives overflow, but still we want to do it. And we want the exact value, not the overflow value. How you can do it? Like we'll the hint is sums. Okay, the hint is array. 
So you can store the entire entire integer or float in an array, digit by digit, and you can have array size, like essentially the size of the RAM, right? This is like two GB, very huge number. So you want to represent a number having storage two GB, you can represent it. And let's say you have two array representing two integer with digit as n. Now you want to do uh, the, the multiplication or let's say you want to do the addition. So how you will do it? Remember like in school, we used to do like digit by digit addition from right to left. Similar way, we will scan array from right to left and we will add it. If there is a carry, then we will add it to the next and then accordingly we will do it. So we will simulate the school logic in this uh, case. Similarly for the multiplication, we will multiply the first digit with all the digit of uh, the first operand. So we will pick first digit of the second operand. We will multiply all the uh, all the with all the digit of the first operand. And then if there is a carry or something like that, then accordingly we have to change the array size and things like that. So if you multiply an, uh, an, uh, 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 a three digit number with three, uh, three digit number, what would be the result? The resultant, uh, what would be the result? Uh, how many digit the result will have? So if the A is, let's say, A is having three digit, B is also having three digit. What is the maximum? Uh, well, maximum digit that result is going to have six, six, right? So you can have two array of size three and three, and then you can have an array of size m cross n, which is uh, m plus n, which is three plus three, six, and it will not overflow. And you will perform this elementary mathematics. You will pick one digit, multiply it, store it in array. If there is a carry, then accordingly you will add it. So how many array you will need? In case of three into three, you need three arrays, right? Three intermediate things are there, right? If you multiply three digit with three, three digit number. Yes. Right? yes. And then there is a resultant array, which is of six, uh, size six. And accordingly, you can shift your element. So remember, so whatever you have done in paper, think it as an array in every intermediate stage and then you can perform. And here you don't uh, have to worry about uh, this overflow because a digit can go from zero to nine. It cannot go beyond that, right? Yes. Sir. Yeah, so this is how you do uh, multiplication, division, addition, even if there is an overflow and you will correctly calculate the value. So Devyansi, uh, please go ahead. Devyansi left. Okay. So we have taken two hours class then. <laughs> okay, so any doubt? No, sir. No, sir. So yeah, you can ask any, uh, any, any doubt now because only seven people have joined and we can spend like five to 10 minutes more. If you have any doubt, any, 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 any interest, any weird thing, no? Okay. Like uh, for web development, like why do we need Java? For web development, we don't need Java. Like it's there was, easier. there was, a, there was a case that uh, the web server used to be uh, running this Java server, right? And that is programmed in Java, Java kind of thing, Java similar language. But for the web development, you don't need to need, uh, learn this Java. There is only one language that you can uh, run, uh, learn it's JavaScript. Deep. JavaScript, not HTML. HTML is very bad thing, and CSS. With JavaScript, you can perform anything. The front end, back end, everything. JavaScript is very powerful in web development. And in application development, you have to learn Java. Not just Java, but the concept behind uh, all the, 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 the concepts that is used in Java, because Java is like actual practical uh, application programming language. Android uses Java, like 1 million devices use Java. 
because of this JVM and because of this object oriented programming concepts. C++ is also having that, but since it is have, still having the pointer thing, so that makes thing little uh, difficult or little, little crazy for the security people. But Java does not have those things. So in web development, if you want to go in that direction, then you can learn JavaScript. That is a like de facto thing. You can do everything front end, back end in JavaScript. There is no need to learn this Java. And you can learn PHP as well. PHP and JavaScript yeah. or Node. There are many back end languages, Node, Ruby or Rails. There are many, but you have to start at one. So for the beginning, you can start with JavaScript. And still going to be used like in new near future. JavaScript is very powerful. But like I saw, I like opened uh, like in my like so like in the web browser, like I randomly open pages, like and like I mean like uh, you you get to view the page source, right? Yeah. So yeah. I, like, I saw that most of them had like the HTML wala thing. Yeah, as most of them actually JavaScript generate those HTML pages. You can generate it from the backend. You can generate HTML codes from the Ruby on Rails or from the Node. So you write some HTML, which is a, a front end, and dynamically you can generate the content of those uh, those classes. So you divide your entire HTML in various classes, and then you can generate the content and the design of those using JavaScript or from the back end you can fetch and then you can generate. But yeah, whatever you are getting uh, from in your browser, everything is kind of JavaScript and CSS. Now uh, everything is kind of HTML and CSS. There is a JavaScript, but that is just one, one line now. There's uh, there is a this tag is script. Very simple tag, but it does the actual magic. So when you open this face, uh, not Facebook, when you open this Microsoft, Amazon, or Flipkart, you will see a lot of JavaScript is there. Even yes. Flipkart, when you open Flipkart, there is a, this uh, in your browser, in modern browser. There is a, this install option comes into picture. So you can install a web app. So there is a concept of web app that is a independent of any platform, any Android or iOS. It just need a browser. And you have designed an app, which is a independent of any platform. So if you are you want to design an app, you want to see whether you want to design with Windows, uh, iOS, Android. But if you want to design the web app, you just need a browser. And it is universal. So the industry is switching in that direction. Still, Android app is like uh, used a lot, Android and iOS apps, yeah. because of its limitations. Okay. Okay. Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Yeah. So we'll terminate to this session. Then, any doubt? No. Omar Sarma, you have not asked any doubt, but you are still in the class. <laughs> <laughs>